Hello, welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara, and we have recently been reading John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, and we're on chapter 26, and let's get into that. Tom picked up a three-gallon bucket and looked at it for a full of holes on the bottom. Sure, said the nearsighted clerk, that keeps people from stealing them. All right, down in that section, get going. The four Joads took their buckets and went into the orchard. They don't waste no time, Tom said. Christ Almighty Al said, I'd rather work in a garage. Pa had followed do docilely into the field. He turned suddenly on Al. Now you just quit it. He said, you've been a ha hankering and a complaining and a bull blowing. You get to work. You ain't so big I can't lick you yet. Al's face turned red with anger. He started to bluster. Tom moved near to him. Come on, Al, he said quietly. Bread and meat, we gotta get them. They reached for the fruit and dropped them in the buckets. Tom r ran at his work. One bu bucket full, two buckets. He dumped them in a box. Three buckets. The box was full. I just made a nickel, he called. He picked up the box and walked hurriedly to the station. He has a nickel worth. Nickel's worth, he said to the checker. The man looked into the box, turned over a peach or two. Put it over there. That's out, he said. I told you not to bruise them. Dumped them out of the bucket, didn't you? Well, every damn peach is bruised. Can't check that one. Put them in easy or you're working for nothing. Why, God damn it! Now go easy. I warned you before you started. Tom's eyes drooped sullenly. Okay, he said. Okay, he went quickly back to the others. Might as well dump what you got. He said. Yours is the same as mine. Won't take them. Now what the hell? Al began. Got to pick easier. Can't drop them in the bucket. Got to lay them in. They started again. This time they handled the fruit gently. The boxes filled more j slowly. We could figure something out. I bet Tom said. If Ruthie and Winfield or Rosa Sharon just Put him in the boxes. We could work out a system. He carried his newest box to the station. Is this here worth a nickel? Jacker looked them over. Dug down several layers. That's better, he said. He checked the box in. Just take it easy. Tom hurried back. I got a nickel, he called. I got a nickel. On, only got to do that in there, that there 20 times or a dollar. They worked on steadily through the afternoon. Ruthie and Winfield found them after a while. You got... To go to work, Pa told them, you got to put the peaches carefully in the box. Here now, one at a time. The children squatted down and picked the peaches out of the extra bucket, and a line of buckets stood ready for them. Tom carried the pull boxes to the station. That's seven, he said. That's eight. Forty cents we got. Got a nice piece of meat for forty cents. The afternoon passed. Ruthie tried to go away. I'm tired, she whined. I got to rest. You gotta stay right where you're at, said Pa. <clears throat> Uncle John picked slowly. He picked one bucket to taunt two of Tom's. His pace didn't change. In mid afternoon, Ma came trudging out. I would have just c come before, but Rosa Sharon faded, she said. Just fainted away. You've been eating peaches, she said to the children, while well, they bl blast you out. Ma Stubby's body moved quickly. She bent in her bucket, bucket quickly and picked it into her apron. When the sun went down, they had picked 20 boxes. Tom set the 20th box down. A buck, he said. How long do we work? Work till dark, long as you can see. Well, can we get credit now? Ma ought to go in and buy some stuff to eat. Sure, I'll give you a slip for a dollar now. He wrote on a strip of paper and handed it to Tom. He took it to Ma. Here you are. You can get a dollar's worth of stuff at the store. Ma put her put down her bucket and straightened her shoulders. Get you the first time, don't it? Sure, we'll all get used to it right off. Roll on in and get some food. Ma said, what'll you like to eat? Meat, said Tom. Meat and bread and a big pot of coffee with sugar in it. Great big piece of meat. Ruthie wailed. Ma, we're tired. Better come along in them. They was tired when they started, Pa said. Wild as rabbits they are getting, and ain't going to be no good at all unless we can pin them down. Soon as we get set down, they'll go to school, said Ma. She trudged away, and Ruthie and Winfield timidly followed her. We got to work every day, Winfield asked. Ma stopped and waited. She took his hand and waited along, holding it. Ain't work, she said. Be good for you, and you're helping us. If we all work, part, pretty soon we'll live in a nice house. We all got to help. But I got so tired. I know, I got tired too. Everybody gets wore out. Gotta think about stuff. 
Think about when you'll go to school. I don't want to go no, to no school. Ruthie don't neither. Them kids goes that goes to school, we seen them. Ma snots, calls us okies. We seen them. I ain't a-going. Ma looked pityingly down on her straw hair. Don't give us no trouble right now, she begged. Soon as we get on our feet, you can be bad, but not now. We got too much now. I ate six of them peaches, Ruthie said. Well, you'll have, have the skitters, and it ain't close to no toilet where we are. The company store was a large shed of corrugated iron. It had no display window. Ma opened the screen door and went in. A tiny man stood behind the counter. He was completely bald and his head was blue-white. Large brown eyes, eyebrows covered his eyes in such a high arc that his face seemed surprised and a little frightened. His nose was long and thin and curved like a bird's beak, and his nostrils were blocked with a light brown hair. Over the sleeves of his blue shirt, he wore black satin sleeve protectors. He was leaning on his elbows on the counter when Ma entered. Afternoon, she said. He inspected her with interest. The arch over his eyes became higher. Howdy, I got a slip here for a dollar. You can get a dollar's worth, he said, and he giggled shrilly. Yes, sir, a dollar's worth. One dollar's worth. He moved his hands at the stock. Any of it. He pulled the sleeve protectors up neatly. Thought I'd get a piece of meat. Got all kinds, he said. Hamburg, like to have some Hamburg. Twenty cents a pound, Hamburg. Ain't that awful high? Seems to me Hamburg was fifteen last time. I got some. Well, he giggled softly. Yes, it's high. In the same time, it ain't high. Time you go on in town for a couple of pounds of Hamburg, it'll cost you about a gallon gas. So you see, it ain't really high here, because you got no gallon of gas. Ma said sternly, it didn't cost you no gallon of gas to get it out of here. He laughed delightedly. You're looking at, at it backwards, he said. He said, we ain't a-buying it. We are a-selling it. If we was buying it, why, that'd be different. Ma put two fingers in her mouth and frowned with thought. It looks all full of fat and gristle. I ain't guaranteeing she won't cook down, the storekeeper said. I ain't guaranteeing I'd eat her myself. But there's a lot of stuff I wouldn't do. Ma looked at him fiercely for a moment. She controlled her voice. Ain't you got some cheaper kind of meat? Soup bones, he said. Ten cents a pound. But them's just bones. <clears throat> them's just bones, he said. Make nice soup. Just bones. Got any boiling beef? Oh, yeah. Sure. That's two bits a pound. Maybe I can get no meat. Can't get no meat, Ma said. But they want meat. They said they wanted meat. Everybody wants meat. Needs meat. That hamburger's pretty nice stuff. Use the grease that comes out of her for gravy. Pretty nice. No waste. Don't throw no bone away. How about... How? How much is side meat? Well, now you're getting into fancy stuff. Christmas stuff. Thanksgiving stuff. 35 cents a pound. I could sell you turkey cheaper if I had some turkey. And Ma sighed. Give me two pounds of hamburger. Yes, ma'am. He scooped the pale meat on a piece of wax paper. And what else? Well, some bread. Right here. Fine, big loaf. Fifteen cents. That there's a twelve-cent loaf. Sure it is. Go right in town and get her for twelve cents. Gallon of gas. What else can I sell you? Potatoes? Yes, potatoes. Five pounds for a quarter. Ma moved menacingly toward him. I heard enough from you. I know what they cost in town. The little man cla clamped his mouth tight. Then go get him in town. Ma looked at her knuckles. What is this? She asked softly. You own this here store? No, I just work here. Any reason you got to make fun? That helps you help you any? She regarded her shiny, wrinkled hands. The little man was silent. Who owns this here store? Hooper Ranches, Incorporated, ma'am. And they set the prices? Yes, ma'am. She looked up, smiling a little. Everybody comes in and talks like me is mad. He hesitated for a moment. Yes, ma'am. And that's why you make fun? What you mean? Doing a dirty thing like this shames you, don't it? Got to act flip, huh? Her voice was gentle. The clerk watched her fascinated. He didn't answer. That's how it is, Ma, said finally. Forty cents for meat. Fifteen for bread. Quarter for potatoes. That's eighty cents. Coffee? Twenty cents, the cheapest, ma'am. And that's the dollar. Seven of us work, and that's supper. She studied her hand. Wrap them up, she said quietly, quickly. Yes, ma'am, he said. Thanks. He put the potatoes in a bag and folded the top carefully down. His eyes slipped to Ma and then hid in his work again. She watched him and she smiled a little. How'd you get a job like this, she asked. A fella got to eat, he began, and then belligerently, a fella got a right to eat. What fella, Ma asked. He placed the four packages on the counter. Meat, he said. Potatoes, bread, coffee, one dollar even. 
She handed him her slip of paper and watched while he entered the name and the amount in a ledger. There, he said, now we're all even. Ma uh, picked up her bag. Say, she said, we got no sugar for the coffee. My boy Tom, he wants sugar. Look, he said, there's a, they're working out there. You let me have some sugar and I'll bring the slip in later. The little man looked away, took his eyes as far from Ma as he could. I can't do it, he said softly. That's the rule. I can't. I'd get in trouble. I'd get canned. But there's a working out in the field now. They got more than a dime coming. Give me ten cents of sugar. Tom, he wanted sugar in his coffee. He spoke about it. I can't do it, man. That's the rule. No slip, no groceries. The manager, he talks about that all the time. No, I can't do it. No, I can't. They'd catch me. They always catch fellas. Always. I can't. For a dime? For anything, ma'am. He looked pleadingly at her. And then his face lost its fear. He took ten cents from his pocket and rang it up in the cash register. There, he said with relief. He pulled a little bag from under the counter, whipped it open, and scooped some sugar into it. Weighed the bag and added a little more sugar. There you are, he said. Now it's all right. You bring in your slip, slip and I'll get my dime back. Ma studied him. Her hand went blindly out and put a little bag of sugar, sugar on the pile in her arm. Thanks to you, she said quietly. She started for the door, and when she reached it, she turned. Well, I'm learning one thing good, he said. She said, learning it all the time, every day. If you're in trouble or hurt or need, go to poor people. They're the only ones that'll help, the only ones. The screen door slammed behind her. The little man leaned his elbows on the counter and looked after her with his surprised eyes. A plump tortoiseshell cat leaped up on the counter and stalked lazily near to him. It rubbed sideways against his arm, and he reached out with his hand and pulled it against his cheek. The cat purred loudly, and the tip of its tail jerked back and forth. Tom and Al and Pa and Uncle Joe, John walked in from the orchard when the dusk was deep. Their feet were a little heavy against the road. You wouldn't think just reaching up and picking would get you, get you in the back, Pa said. Be all right in a couple of days, said Tom. Say, Pa, after we eat, I'm going to walk out and see what all that fuss is outside the gate. It's been a-working on me. Want to come? No, said Pa. I'd like to have a little while to just work and not think about nothing. Seems like I've just been beating my brains to death for a hell of a long time. No, I'm going to set a while and then go to bed. How about Al? How about you, Al? Al looked away. Guess I'll look around in here first, he said. Well, I know Uncle John won't come. Guess I'll go her alone. Got me all curious. Pa said, I'll get a hell of a lot curiouser before I'll do anything about it. With all them cops out there, maybe they ain't there at night, Tom suggested. Well, I ain't gonna find out, and you better not tell Ma where you're going. She'll just squirt her head off worrying. Tom turned to Al. Ain't you curious? Guess I'll just look around this here camp, Al said. Looking for girls, huh? Minding my own business, Al said acidly. I'm still a-going, said Tom. They emerged from the orchard into the dusty street between the red shacks. The low light... Yellow light of kerosene lanterns shone from some of the doorways and inside the half gloom. The black shapes of people moved about. At the end of the street, a, a guard still sat, his shotgun resting against his knee. Tom paused as he passed the guard. Got a place where a fellow can get a bath, mister? The guard studied him in the half light. At last, he said, see that water tank? Yeah. Well, there's a hose over there. Any warm water? Say... Who in hell you think you are, J.P. Morgan? No, said Tom. No, I sure don't. Good night, mister. The guard grunted contemptuously. Hot water for Christ's sake. Be wanting tubs next. He stared glumly after the four Jodes. A second guard come around the end house. What's the matter, Mac? Why them goddamn Okies is they warm water, he says. The second guard rested his gum butt on the ground. It's them government camps, he said. I bet that fellow been in the government camp. We ain't going to have no peace till we wipe them camps out. They'll be wanting clean sheets first thing we know, Mac asked. How is it out at the main gate? Hear anything? Well, they was out there yelling all day. State police got it in hand. They're running the hell out of them smart guys. I heard they, there's a long, lean son of a bitch spark, spark plugging the thing. Fella says they'll get him tonight, and then she'll go to pieces. We won't have no job if it comes too easy, Max said. We'll have a job, all right. These goddamn Hokies, you got to watch them all the time. Things get a little quiet. We can always stir them up a little. Have trouble when they cut the raid here, I guess. We sure will. No, you needn't worry about us having work. Not while Hooper's snubbing clothes. 
The fire roared in the Jode house. Hamburger patties splashed and hissed in the grease, and the potatoes bubbled. The house was full of smoke, and the yellow lantern light threw heavy black shadows on the walls. Ma worked quickly about the fire while Rosa Sharon sat on a box resting her heavy abdomen on her knees. Feeling better now, Ma asked. Smells of cooking gets me. I'm hungry, too. Go set in the door, Ma said. I got to have that box to break up anyways. The men trooped in. Meat, by God, said Tom, and coffee. I smell her. Jesus, I'm hungry. Add a lot of peaches, but they didn't do no good. Where can we wash, Ma? Go down to the water tank. Wash down there. I just sent Ruthie and wouldn't be able to wash. The men went out again. Go on now, Rosa Sharon, Ma ordered. Either you set in the door... Or else in the bed, I gotta break that box up. The girl helped herself up with her hands. She moved heavily to one of the mattresses and sat down on it. Ruthie and Winfield came in quietly, trying by silence and by keeping close to the wall to remain obscure. Ma looked over at them. I got a feeling you little fellows is lucky they ain't much light, she said. She pounced at Winfield and felt his hair. Well, you got wet anyway, but I bet you ain't clean. There wasn't no soap, Winfield complained. No, that's right. I couldn't buy no soap. Not today. Maybe we can get soap tomorrow. She went back to the stove, laid out the plates, and began to serve the supper. Two patties apiece and the baked potato. She placed three slices of bread on each plate. When the meat was all out of the frying pan, she poured a little of the grease on each plate. The men came in again, their faces dripping and their hair shining with water. Leave me at her, Tom cried. They took the plates. They ate silently, wolfishly, and wiped up the grease with the bread. The children retired into the corner of the room, put their plates on the floor, and knelt in front of the food like little animals. Tom swallowed the last of his bread. Got any more, Ma? No, she said. That's all. He made a dollar, and that's a dollar's worth. That? They charged an extra over out here. We got to go in town when we can. I ain't full, said Tom. Well, tomorrow you'll get in a full day. Tomorrow night we'll have plenty. Al wiped his mouth on his sleep. Guess I'll take a look around, he said. Wait, I'll go with you. Tom followed him outside. and In the darkness, Tom went close to his brother. Sure you don't want to come with me? No, I'm going to look around like I said. Okay, said Tom. He turned away and strolled down the street. The smoke from the houses hung low to the ground, and the lanterns threw their pictures of doorways and windows into the street. On the doorstep, Steps. People sat and looked out into the darkness. Tom could see their heads turn as their eyes followed him down the street. At the street end, the dirt road continued across a stubble field. The black lumps of haycocks were visible in the starlight. A thin blade of moon was low in the sky toward the west, and the long cloud of the Milky Way trailed clearly overhead. Tom's feet sounded softly on the dusky, dusty road, a dark patch against the yellow stubble. He put his hands in his pockets and trudged along toward the main gate. An embankment came close to the road. Tom could hear the whisper of water against the grasses in the irrigation ditch. He climbed up the bank and, cli and looked down on the dark water and saw the stretch reflections of the stairs. The state road was ahead. Car lights swooping past showed where it was. Tom set out again toward it. He could see the high wire gate in starlight. A figure stirred beside the road. A voice said, Hello, who is it? Tom stopped and stood still. Who are you? A man stood up and walked near. Tom could see the gun in his hand. Then a flashlight played on his face. Where you think you're going? Well, I thought I'd take a walk. Any law against it? You better walk some other way, Tom asked. Can't I even get out of here? Not tonight you can't. Want to walk back or shall I whistle some help and take you? Hell, said Tom. It ain't nothing to me. If it's going to cause a mess, I don't give a darn. Sure, I'll go back. The dark figure relaxed. The flash went off. You see, it's for your own good. Them crazy pickets might get you. What pickets? Them goddamn reds. Oh, said Tom. I didn't know about them. You seen them when you come, didn't you? Well, I seen a bunch of guys. But there were so many cops, I didn't know. Thought it was an accident. Well, you better get along back. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell and stay tuned for the next installment of John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, Chapter 26.